Big machines and a bit of a mystery. We're continuing to follow breaking news this evening. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar giving an update just a few minutes ago after a missing person tip sent deputies to a home off of Home Green Road. Our Jaffney Gray is there at the scene, has been following the latest developments. Jaffney, what have we learned so far? Yes, guys, we found out that that missing person that they've been searching for was 38 year old Curtis Perry. Now, if you look right here at the scene, you'll see it's still active. Uh, investigators have been out here searching that home right there and the grounds behind it. Uh, they plan to do so throughout the night. But again, back in July, that's when Perry disappeared. They said that it was a violent incident that uh, led to his demise. Now, they said during the course of the investigation, they were able to link several suspects of other violent crimes to his disappearance. Now, again, another fact in this case that they were able to figure this all out is that part of that incident that turned violent uh, was caught on surveillance video at a home nearby the area where he disappeared. Now, again, in the video, you see that it was at a chase of some sort where he disappears out of the view of the camera and then he goes on. Uh, but then he just disappears again. Right now, they know and believe that he fell victim to foul play. Uh, again, the suspects caught up to them. They're still trying to figure this out. And right now, at this time, they are planning to stay out here. In fact, uh, Sheriff Javier Salazar said that they plan to have the uh, command center brought out here. They'll be here throughout the entire night searching again at this time. There's some evidence that shows that uh, whoever tipped them off to where Perry was at this location, they have found some details. He haven't gone into extreme details about that. But again, once that becomes available, we'll be sure to bring the, that as soon as possible on KSAT.com and later on in our newscast. All right, Jaffney, thank you. Renters at a local apartment complex say their health is being endangered by recurring power outages, which they claim have gone on for months. Today, management brought in several large generators as a temporary fix and say they're working on a permanent solution. But renters told us not only do the makeshift generators often fail, they've heard similar promises before. Here's Devin Clark with a closer look. We had to rent a motel for two days and we don't even have that kind of money. Steve Rocco says because of health reasons, he and his family were forced out of their Spanish Spur apartment home Sunday evening around 6 when the power went out. My baby is on a ventilator. She was very ill. We lost all our groceries. Rocco and other tenants like Joshua Algren say this isn't the first time they've been left in the dark. Almost once a week, the power goes out. Like Rocco, Algren says Sunday's outage left him dealing with health issues. I also am on a breathing machine, so my machine shut off, so I couldn't breathe. Tenants tell me it took 26 hours after the power went out for management to bring in these generators, but the problem is they're unreliable. They say the power went out again and didn't come back on until early this morning. We contacted CPS Energy, which had no reports of outages in the area. Today, the property manager, who has been on the job for just under two months, admits the issue is internal, but says it will be resolved soon. From my understanding, they say two to three days. I'm not, I can't quote you on that, but that's what what my conversation was with the uh, electrical company that we hired. But after hearing similar promises before, tenants here are not holding their breaths. On the southeast side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. The county records actually show the Spanish Spur apartment complex changed ownership this past March after the previous owner filed for bankruptcy. The social unrest that has gripped the country over the last several months is now having an impact on the trial of a man accused of killing a San Antonio police officer. Otis McCain is charged with gunning down SAPD Detective Benjamin Marconi back in 2016. This year around the nation and here locally, protesters have demanded change in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Some protests peaceful, others were not. When interviews of jurors begin in McCain's trial next week, the judge will use a questionnaire addressing the issues raised during these demonstrations. We want to make sure that if any individual potential juror um, has been affected in any way by any of the social issues um, that have been brought forth um, in society, that they have an opportunity to explain that. If he is convicted, McCain is facing the death penalty for the 2016 execution style killing of Detective Marconi. He was shot in the head as he sat in his patrol car outside of police headquarters. Around Texas, a spray of bullets in Houston this morning, leaving a police officer dead, another injured. That fallen officer has been identified as 41 year Houston police veteran Sergeant Harold Preston. CN Rhodes has been following the story all day and tells us what led up to this tragic loss. 
I heard about six gunshots and they weren't small. They were really big gunshots. Risha Johnson woke up to chaos outside her door just after eight this morning. Oh my goodness. I don't know what kind of gun the, the resident had, but it was big. No handgun. Why is there a shootout going on? Well, it was a shootout now, it's a standoff. Houston police called out to the Richmond Manor apartments by the estranged wife of 51 year old Elmer Manzano. She was trying to move out and get items from the family apartment. He wouldn't let her in. Officers say they'd been on scene for more than an hour when Manzano's 14 year old son managed to unlock the apartment door. The son sees that the dad has armed himself with a firearm and tells the officer he has a gun. HPD says Manzano immediately opened fire. Shooting multiple rounds at officers, striking Officer uh, Courtney Waller in the arm and striking Sergeant Preston multiple times. SWAT and canine units surrounded the apartment and two and a half hours later, Manzano gave himself up. The suspect looked out the window, saw the heavy police presence and he came out and surrendered. In Houston, Sion Rhodes, KSAT 12 News. Bear County Commissioners approved a $4 million grant program specifically for bars and restaurants. Most of the money, about $3.75 million, will be paid out in grants of up to $25,000. The rest is to pay a lift fund to administer the program, as it has for previous city and county programs, which definitely have not met all the need. We weren't able to award all of the businesses. We had um, more restaurants and bars and other businesses apply than we had funding in the previous rounds. So this round is to help make up for that. To be eligible, the bar or restaurant has to take in $5 million or less in annual revenue, have 60 or fewer employees, and have seen at least a 15% loss in revenue. The eight day window to apply opens up on October 26th. Businesses that unsuccessfully applied for the previous lift fund run city and county programs won't have to do the paperwork again. It comes to you in the form of a text message asking you to participate in a COVID-19 case study promising some hefty compensation. Those who have received these texts have asked us, is this how real companies are recruiting study participants? To find out, Courtney Freeman ran it through our KSAT Trust Index. Two text messages sent to separate people with almost the same message make up to $1,220 for a local COVID-19 case study. To determine their legitimacy, we cast a wide web, reaching out to hospital systems, research centers, and consumer watchdogs. I would be highly suspicious of a message that comes to you unsolicited from an unidentified source, apparently offering you lots and lots of money and then trying to get you to click on a link. Um, just don't do it. Dr. Ruth Berggren is an infectious disease specialist at UT Health San Antonio's Long School of Medicine. Everyone else we asked echoed her response. Metro Health sent us a statement saying no institutional review board's approved study would have incentives with a dollar amount this high. Baptist Health System statement said individuals are putting themselves at risk for malware and cyber attacks. The Regional Better Business Bureau advises if you've signed up for a medical study and are anticipating some sort of outreach, contact the company directly to find out if it's legitimate. All that being said, Dr. Berggren says there are many legitimate studies by researchers working to defeat COVID-19. I don't want people to shut down and become so fearful that they don't respond to anything. She's currently working with Metro Health and the COVID Community Response Coalition on surveys that will be sent to vaccine providers and eventually the general public. We will be sending out our ask via the Bear County Medical Society, via the STRAC, you know, Emergency Operations um, Coalition, via Metro Health and via UT Health. So in terms of recruitment for COVID studies, we're marking this be careful on the KSAT Trust Index. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera at I-35 and Randolph. And you can see things are busy out here, but they are moving along. No major traffic trouble to tell you about. Let's look outside with live cam this evening. 88 degrees out there right now. A touch cooler than yesterday, but the heat and humidity is just hanging around, Adam. Yeah, it is. And we're in a pretty repetitive pattern here just for a few more days. And then we will notice some changes, especially by the first part of the weekend. Today, for the second day in a row, we were we missed the record high temperature by just one degree. So we were shy of the record by one degree yesterday. 
and today unseasonably warm 10 degrees above average with that high of 91. Right now we're at 88 dew point is 63 so it's unseasonably warm and yes it's muggy outside. 90 in Holotus Port SA measuring 88. 89 in New Braunfels, 85 in Comfort. For the most part, we're just well into the 80s and still hanging on to lower 90s, especially west of town. Carrizo Springs 91 in Del Rio following suit at 91. So partly cloudy this evening. You'll notice that humidity get even thicker later on tonight, and then that's going to lead to some low clouds and drizzle. Temperatures gradually falling off through the 80s and 70s, and I think we'll start the day tomorrow at 73 degrees. Then sunny and right near 90 again into the afternoon. Some patchy morning drizzle with the low clouds, but plenty of afternoon sunshine. We could use some rain. Unfortunately, that drizzle has just added up to a few hundredths of an inch the past couple of mornings. Aquifer, aquifer down half a foot today. We're about four feet below the October average and stage one watering restrictions. Mold and ragweed measured, but both on the low end. We'll talk about the pending cold front, when it's going to arrive, and what it means behind it for your weekend coming right up. All right, thanks, Adam. And then also after the break, COVID-19 in Bear County. We'll join Mayor Ron Nirenberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf for an update on the latest numbers during the daily briefing. Commissioner Kevin Wolf. We're also joined tonight by the director of our city's Neighborhood and Housing Services Department, Vero Soto, who's going to talk a little bit about our emergency housing assistance available through the city. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 168 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our cumulative total since the pandemic began to 63,594. The new seven-day moving average is 158. Thankfully, we have no new deaths to report tonight, but we know the toll from the pandemic has been great, so please continue to keep our friends and family and neighbors who have lost loved ones in your prayers. Tonight there are 189 patients in the hospital with COVID-19, including 24 uh, new COVID-19 related admissions over the last 24 hours, and we do have 91 patients in the ICU and 42 patients on ventilators this evening. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Vero in a minute, but let me uh, turn it over first to Commissioner Wolf who has some news regarding county programs that are available. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, real quickly, uh, the governor came out not too long ago talking about uh, when bars may open, etc. cetera. Uh, the county judge has put together a request to a to TABC, which must be approved first. That'll take a couple of days. But to give you the top line pieces, bars will be able to open up to 50% occupancy. Uh, they must have all of the already discussed ad nauseum, uh, you know, safeties in place, social distancing, et cetera. Uh, for those bars that have been operating as restaurants, uh, it really is no particular change to you. These are, this will apply, as I say, to, to what, what I would call regular bars, so to speak, that, that only deal in that. So 50% here in the near future, uh, keep your eyes out for that. The other piece that uh, is important to the Restaurant and Bar Association is the county today approved $4 million in relief grants uh, that will be given to restaurant and bars. Uh, applications will start to be taken on October 26th. We'll close out applications November 2nd and then have those grants out to restaurants and bars by November 30th. Those will be in $25,000 block grants. Great. Mayor, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and also our thanks to the court for its continued conducting of a safe and fair election here in the county. Let me turn it over now to Vera Soto to talk about the city's emergency housing assistance program. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. Um, we still have assistance for those that have been impacted by the pandemic through our emergency housing assistance program. Uh, the county also has a program to help folks that's called TRAM. And our emergency housing assistance program helps by paying the rent or the mortgage directly to the landlord or creditor for two consecutive months. And we also offer cash assistance for a third month if that is also needed. Needed. Those who are uh, lower income level are also eligible for two months of utility and internet assistance for those bills and a cash assistance um, for fuel and groceries as well. If you are approved and your landlord receives a payment, we have a dashboard where you can check the status of your application. And that is all part of our emergency housing assistance program with the public dashboard available now. 
We also are concerned about those facing eviction, and we do have additional resources. Of course, all the information is at COVID-19, San Antonio.gov. You can call 311 as well. And under COVID-19, San Antonio.gov backslash evictions, we have additional resources for those facing eviction. First, we have information about the Know Your Rights programs, including videotaped information about that and the Right to Counsel program. And if you do receive a notice to vacate, that does not mean that you have to leave. That's just the first step in an eviction process. After a notice to vacate, the landlord still has to file an eviction with the court and pay a fee. Only then will you get a court hearing notice and then you receive information as well about the CDC eviction moratorium and a sample declaration. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on that. The eviction hearing, um, we ask that if you get a hearing that you show up and show that you have filed the declaration. All right, the focus today of today's daily briefing, a lot on resources that are available for people who have uh, been suffering throughout this pandemic, especially with the loss of income. We did hear uh, Veronica Soto with the city there talking about the housing assistance that's available, help for people who may be facing eviction. Uh, there is monetary resources available through the city and the county. The city's resources, again, if you missed that website where you can go find the information, you can find it all at COVID-19.SanAntonio. Antonio.gov. And we also heard uh, the county commissioner, Kevin Wolf, talking about the assistance that is available for bars. Of course, we talked to a local bar owner yesterday at six and then again at 10 o'clock, somebody different. Uh, and they are hurting. And so these will be $25,000 block grants. The application process takes place on October 26. That's when the applications can start to become in. They will be paid out on November 30th. Uh, he also went over some protocols. Still no definite time, though, when bars can reopen. It's still apparently now in the hands of the TABC. All right, let's turn to the weather now. And we are just kind of stuck in this pattern, Adam. But we do have some changes down the road. We do have some changes to talk about and even the potential for a stronger cold front into next week. But right now, don't get excited about it because it's just one of the off chance possibility. So let's talk about what's happening out there right now and get you into this first little week cold front that's going to be hitting us Friday evening. We had those patchy clouds today, had a hard time developing uh, upward because of a little inversion up above us. So we had a capped atmosphere, 88 degrees, dew point is 63, and we're running above average for this time of year. It's not going to change until we get into Saturday. At that point, we'll be a little closer to normal, but briefly. 90 degrees now in Carrizo Springs, 89 Uvalde. LaGrange is at 86 and Rock Springs at 81. Across the state, we don't have that big temperature difference that we had yesterday. Remember when Abilene, Dallas were in the 60s and we even had some 50s in North Texas? That's not the case today. That boundary has retreated northward and all of Texas is feeling the warmer weather, but it's quite a contrast across the nation. That polar air is in the northern tier of the US and it's definitely making an impact there and letting its presence be known. The jet stream strong right now and it's just to the north of us. So we're on the warm side of the jet stream on the cold side. We're talking eight inches of snow there on the cold side of the jet stream around here. We'd be lucky to squeeze in a shower the next few days. It's not likely other than maybe a stray shower along the coast tomorrow, 73 in the morning, making it to 88 by the afternoon and then same old until Saturday, lower humidity, sunny and right near 80 for the high temperature. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, so they've had a week off to recover from what <laughs> happened in Oklahoma. What do they have to say about the eyes of Texas? That seems what all this discussion's been about. We have expectations exhibited by the UT Athletic Director, Chris Del Conte. We have no mandatory against any team member who doesn't participate. What, what does Sam Ellinger, the quarterback who was pictured standing alone in the Cotton Bowl, have to say about all this drama? He'll tell us. And Frank Harris is back as starter for the UTSA Roadrunners. Coming up.
face the Baylor Bears at home this Saturday in Royal Memorial Stadium. There will be more at stake than just trying to win the game and keep the Horns from dropping to 1-3 and three in the Big 12. Be trying to bring the team together. They are clearly fractured in the locker room over what to do about the Eyes of Texas school song that has caused so much controversy this season. It came to a head following the four-overtime loss to the Oklahoma Sooners when this picture taken after the game showed only quarterback Sam Ellinger remaining on the field for the playing of the song. That prompted athletic director Chris Del Conte to issue his expectations in a letter to fans saying he expects all UT student athletes to be present for the playing of the school song even though as head coach Tom Herman just told us yesterday there's no mandate to do so what does Sam Ellinger have to say about all this drama on the field and off the field so to speak I stayed on the field after for longer than than my teammates I was talking to coaches and players um, and so I was out there for a longer time you know all of Oklahoma's players were running, you know, they won, they were celebrating, rightfully so, they won the game. And, you know, you don't want to stand out there um, when there's no band. And it just took a really long time. And then um, remember to, to walk over to where the band normally is, I guess, um, and, and sing the song. When the Longhorns kicked off against the Bears on Saturday at 2.30 p.m., there will be nine-point favors, especially when you consider Baylor hasn't run a play on the field since October the 7th, when they had that massive outbreak of COVID-19 that affected 28 players and 14 staff members. They are just happy to be back playing football. The Black Texas Aggies get a week off to enjoy their back-to-back -back SEC wins over Florida, now Mississippi State, and their seventh ranking in the nation as a result of their 3-1 start. They're rushing for 114 yards and scoring two touchdowns in the 28-17 victory in Starkville. Aggie running back Isaiah Spiller has been named as the Earl Campbell Tyler Rose Player of the Week honorable mention. This is the eighth time he has surpassed the 100-yard mark in his career at A&M and the third time this season, and is now second in the conference in rushing 12th nationally with an average of 107.5 yards per game. And still head coach Jimbo Fisher sees room for improvement. Uh, Isaiah's really growing. Uh, his size is learning to use his power. Learn, you got to learn to be a one-cut guy. You don't need to dance, need to run. Don't learn to run through color. Learn to, as I say, drop that shoulder near leg and take two-yard runs and make a four-yard run. Four-yard, six-yard runs. That's what great backs do. You get that? All right, the Aggies will next host Arkansas on Halloween night at Kyle Field with kickoff set for 6.30. When the UTSA Roadrunners face Louisiana Tech this Saturday night in the Alamo Dome, they'll be trying to snap out of their three-game losing streak, and they will have to do it with a new starting quarterback again after Lowell Narcisse went down in the fourth quarter, is now out for the season with an injured ankle. In steps, Frank Harris out of Clemens to take over again after he was beat out by Narcisse and practice to start against Army last weekend in the Alamo Dome. Today, Frank was asked what it was like to come off the bench that late in the game, something he hasn't done a lot in his career as a quarterback. You know, I didn't start my sophomore year in high school, but when I got the opportunity, I made the most of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you hate to see Lowell go down like that. You know, uh, the praise go out for him. He's been through that too many times. I, I just stayed ready, just like everybody else did. My, my lineman always stayed ready. Uh, so, you know, it's not, not too much to it. All right, kickoff between UTSA and Louisiana Tech on Saturday night. The Alamo Dome is set for 7 p.m. Coming up tonight on the night beat, head coach Mike McCarthy is asked about the unrest from players about the coaching staff. A lot of rumbling. Yes. In Big D today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and so we want to get some questions answered about breast cancer, its severity, and the pandemic. Our guest on our KSAD Q&A today, medical oncologist and breast cancer researcher, Dr. Kate Lathrop. She is also with the Mays Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio, MD Anderson. Doctor, thank you for joining us. For right off the bat, how important are screenings and are you seeing people reluctant to come in for them because of COVID? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's a question that I get a lot from my patients. Um, Screening is really important in breast cancer. The earlier we can detect a breast cancer, the higher the chance of us curing women of that breast cancer. And mammography is a really important tool that we have to catch breast cancer in an early stage where a woman might not have any symptoms. And if I was to do an exam, I might not even feel the mass. So right now, the general recommendations is that women who are more than age 40 have a mammogram um, every year or at least every two years, depending on which organization um, you're asking. So as far as COVID and how that's affect things, 
back when our numbers were really pretty high in June and July, we were actually asking some of our women not to come in for screening until those numbers got a little bit lower. But now our rates are in a much better place. And I would encourage any woman who's due for their mammogram to contact their physician or self-refer, which is something you can do in the state of Texas, and come in and get a screening mammogram. Every institution, health institution in San Antonio are following safety protocols where the physicians and the techs are masking, the machines are being cleaned in between patients very thoroughly, and there's screenings at almost every clinic at the door. So it's a safe uh, way to get screened for breast cancer, even during COVID. And it's a very important way to help uh, increase how many women survive despite being uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. In the last couple of weeks, since the beginning of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we have aired some stories uh, telling the tale of people being afraid to go in for mammograms, routine procedures in general uh, because of the risks of COVID. But it sounds like, you know, you all were telling people not to come in for a while when the numbers were really high. That's that's a good sign to me that people were eager to come. So are you seeing that effect here? Do you actually think uh, there is that fear out there among patients to, to come in because of COVID? I think there is that fear in general for COVID and maybe on a bigger scale, I think there's a lot of fear around mammography um, outside of the COVID pandemic. Uh, I hear a lot of my patients say, well, you know, I thought it would be painful. I thought it would be expensive. I think it would take a lot of time. And then I, I think another real reason is sometimes women are just afraid um, to get that diagnosis of breast cancer. And so what I would say to any woman out there who maybe fits that picture, uh, you know, I got my first mammogram last year and it was really not a bad experience. Um, it doesn't hurt, it's quick. Um, almost every insurance will cover it for women. And if you don't have the means to pay for a mammogram or you don't have insurance, there are organizations in San Antonio that can help you cover the cost of those mammograms. So if you're ever worried, just you know, come into either the Mays Cancer Center or another clinic nearby you, and I'm sure we can get a mammogram for you in a way that that is not as scary as you think it is. I'm glad you pointed that out because I think that in this day and age where health insurance isn't a given, I think it's great to let people know we can figure out ways that you can get a mammogram that's not going to cost you money if you fit certain parameters. So I'm glad you pointed that out, doctor. I also want to talk about, are there new treatments out there that you are particularly excited about when it comes to breast cancer? Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky to treat women with breast cancer in 2020 because I have so many tools available to treat women with different types of breast cancer at different stages that both help increase our cure rate and for women with metastatic disease, while we don't cure most of those women, we can really extend their lives in a very meaningful way. And the way we get all of those new treatments is with doing clinical trials. And we have hundreds of clinical trials open at the Mays Cancer Center, not just in breast, but in every tumor type. And we often have trials for all kinds of women with breast cancer. Um, so that's something that we definitely try to enroll as many of our patients in San Antonio and South Texas in our clinical trials so that those patients are represented on those trials and we know how those therapies work for them. There's a lot of really new exciting things. Um, the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium is one of the largest breast conferences in the world and it happens every December. And this year we're forging ahead with our virtual um, conference, which will be four days, but uh, a lot of exciting research will be presented there as well. Getting it done even during a pandemic and continuing to raise that awareness. Dr. Kate Lathrop, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Take care. We'll be right back. The race to find a universal cure for COVID-19 is underway across the globe and right here in San Antonio. Studies on all sorts of anti-inflammatory drugs in progress, many of which were used to treat other conditions. Ursula Perry explains how vitamin D is now getting attention as a way to prevent and treat COVID-19. Vitamin D is vital in allowing your body to absorb calcium and strengthen bones. Vitamin D is certainly a, a, a good thing if a physician recommends it. 
But how does it work when it comes to COVID? In a German trial of nearly 10,000 people, researchers found deaths from respiratory illness were three times higher for those with a vitamin D deficiency. At Northwestern University, researchers analyzed data from 10 countries and found patients with severe vitamin D deficiencies were twice as likely to suffer complications from COVID. But experts are cautioning that more research needs to be done and not to overdo it with vitamin D. It can have side effects. Too much vitamin D can be toxic and lead to heart and kidney problems. According to the National Institutes of Health, daily intake of 25 to 100 micrograms, or 1,000 to 4,000 UI, is safe for most people. Two population groups most commonly affected by vitamin D deficiencies are African Americans and the elderly, the two groups also most impacted by COVID-19. Some experts will take it a step further, recommending a daily cocktail of vitamin D, along with vitamin C, an antioxidant that boosts the immune system, as well as zinc, a mineral which some say not only reduces inflammation in the body, but also boosts immunity. You can get a good dose, a natural dose of all three by spending some time in the sunlight and changing the foods you eat. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, check this out. Reese's launching a hands-free candy giveaway promotion this Halloween so kids can trick or treat <laughs> safely as coronavirus remains a concern. The Reese's Trick or Treat door designed to roll through neighborhoods via remote control dispense peanut butter cups upon request. The nine foot robotic contraption announces its presence with smoke, Halloween lights and a spooky soundtrack. And, and just the rolling door feature is creepy as well, right? All you have to do is say trick or treat. The door gives you a king size package of Reese's peanut butter cups. You can ask for the Reese's trick or treat door to come to your town by messaging at Reese's on Instagram. It's pretty cool. It is cool. In the buzz today, fans of The Mandalorian got another new look at what to expect from the second season. Disney has released another new trailer for the Star Wars series. New episodes are just days away from pre premiering on Disney+. Plus. Most of the clip focuses on The Mandalorian's continued adventures with the child. It also includes an ominous moment where he's warned about the worlds he's trying to visit. The Mandalorian returns to Disney Plus on October 30th. Baby Yoda? Is that I think that's the referring child. to. I, yeah. Okay. That's why I was looking at you. <laughs> Lowe's is offering free Christmas tree delivery this year, and they're getting an early start. It's the first time the chain has made the offer, and it comes as a lot of people are staying home amid the pandemic. Starting October 30th, customers can order fresh cut trees and wreaths online or at stores and get them delivered in two to five days. Caskey's over there just shaking his head. Be able to pick it yourself. That's part of the fun. Oh, my sure. a Good, solid tree. Okay. Right. And full tree. We'll get to weather in a second. Anyway, if the order is $45 or more, the delivery is free. The offer is part of the company's overall revamp of its yearly holiday sales event. The season of savings event lineup will include small kitchen appliances, workout equipment, even bedding when the event begins. Caskey will not be part of it. No. These two custom made guitars that belong to the late rock star Eddie Van Halen are going up for auction. One is a 2004 EVH Charvel art series that he played on stage. The other is a creation from Van Halen and his guitar tech that they made at his home. Julian's Auctions will sell them in December during an auction that also includes items from Kurt Cobain, Michael Jackson and other superstars. Van Halen died earlier this month at the age of 65 after a battle with cancer. And the red and black one, he played on the uh, Thriller album. Oh, that I think he also okay. played on Jump and 1984. I, some I knew other that things. you knew that one because one time I walked in the office and you told me a shirt I had on looked like that guitar. <laughs> really? That you, doesn't yes, sound like me. That sounds exactly like <laughs> Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> yeah. That's I thought my, maybe you were a big my fan. Connection to that guitar. I thought maybe you're a big fan. No, I think you're a big fan. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and I'm not against the, the tree delivery. Oh, we're going to talk about trees. trees. Yes, okay. I'm not against it, but it's, it's not for me. You know, you got to go there. It's part of the experience. Cut it open. I'm with you. Yeah, smack it against the ground. See it start to open up a little bit. Twist it, twirl it. Make sure it's good. Mm. You're it's, like the guy on Christmas Story <laughs> who goes to the, goes and, you know, that's a tree. That's a tree. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. Oh, that season's almost here. And actually, my uh, 
homemade thermometer Christmas ornaments are just about completed. Oh, still some work to do, but it's exciting. So we actually had two hundredths of an inch of rain today, just like yesterday. Drizzle. Okay, morning drizzle gives us a little something officially, but nothing significant. 91 was the high that's in San Antonio, but that was only one degree shy of the record for the second day in a row. So yes, this isn't the 100 degree heat that we've been through. So this doesn't feel like much, but it is well above average for this time of year by a good 10 degrees. All right, let's take a look outside and we have a nice sky out there with those fair weather cumulus clouds and some higher level clouds up above them as well. We're at 88 now dew point is 63. So a warm evening considering our average high is 81. Usually we would be about 81 degrees at 4 or 5 p.m. and we're well above that even at sunset. Dew points into the 60s. So yeah, we feel the mugginess, but this is the time of day where the dew points at its lowest and these numbers will be climbing tonight and I think we'll have deweys in the low 70s by tomorrow morning. And with these longer nights, that just means more low clouds drizzle and some dampness to start the day tomorrow. And we're going to stay in this humid pattern all the way through Friday. But Friday evening, a weak cold front slides through. That gives us a brief break from the humidity. I mean, we're talking most of Saturday, a lack of humidity, especially Saturday morning in the first part of the day. But it's still warm out there now. Catula 92 along with Laredo and Del Rio. Those are the warm spots. 87 in Dryden, 85 Alpine. For the most part, we're in the 80s across Texas, whereas yesterday we had those 60s off to the north. Well, that front has pushed northward, and now we're all back in the warmer air in the warmer sector of that front. But look how temperatures really drop off. It's that time of year we take a look at this map to see what kind of colder air is northward and can plunge southward. And all indications are that this colder air, temperatures in the 30s this afternoon, is going to stay bottled up closer to the Canadian border in the northern tier of the US for at least several more days. There is the slight chance, a very off chance, that it could dislodge and come southward and pay Texas a visit by early next week. Well, it's likely to pay Texas a visit, but will it pay us a visit? Right now, that's doubtful. So tomorrow, 88. By Thursday, 90 degrees, still upper 80s again on Friday. Then Saturday, we drop a little bit to right near 80 for the high temperature because of that weak cold front. So we'll get clipped by a weak cold front, but it's not going to have a big impact on our temperatures. That jet stream, of course, delineation between the warm and cold air. And right now it's far to the north of us. And unfortunately, all the activity is along the jet stream in terms of shower action. So for us, maybe a few coastal showers the next few days. Don't count on it. And then Monday, Tuesday, with the potential of that front making it here, we're throwing in a 20% chance, but that's all we're giving it for now. Tomorrow, 73 in the morning, 88 by the afternoon. We repeat it all the way through Friday, Saturday, that drop in humidity. 59 Saturday morning, sunny, and most of the day spent in the 70s. And again, there is that possible front early next week. It's a possibility, but not a probability for here in South Texas as of now. I'm just right. sad we didn't see you play air guitar at some point during that buzz story. Oh, you're talking about me? Yeah. I thought you were talking about Caskey playing air <laughs> no. guitar. He probably doesn't believe in that. Hmm. In case oh, you missed come it, on. In case you missed it coming up next. I'm a pro. I missed the air guitar. <laughs>morning everybody it's october 20th thanks for joining us this morning new this morning a woman is in the hospital after she was thrown from a jeep not too far from the medical center san antonio police say a man was driving a jeep when he lost control and rolled the vehicle over officers say the woman in the passenger seat was thrown out and taken to the hospital in critical condition the driver only had minor injuries police are still looking into what caused the driver to crash some new information on a fatality along the loop 410 this morning a man hit and killed while crossing the highway has been identified as 53-year-old Fernando Gonzalez. San Antonio police say that around 4 this morning, Gonzalez was walking near 410 near Calabra when a Ford F-250 hit him. The driver is not expected to face any charges. Gonzalez died at the scene. First and five, we have breaking news on the far north side. A crash involving an 18 wheeler near I 10 and Camp Bullis. San Antonio firefighters tell us at least one person was taken to the hospital. It's unclear what caused the crash, but as you can see, the vehicle was stuck underneath the 18 wheeler. And out of the latest on a violent shooting in Houston, one officer dead, another recovering. The suspect is in custody. The fallen officer has been identified as Sergeant Harold Preston. 
a 41 year veteran of the Houston Police Department. And now to an update on the district attorney's new civil rights division. Today, county commissioners approved a $386,000 budget to get the program started. We first told you about the new four person team last week. The division will focus on in custody deaths, police shootings, and excessive force cases.